Welcome to The Craft Life, episode six. Today is a special episode, and I'm really excited about it. So I got a question for you all. Do you like to hear great stories? Well, I sure do. I like to hear those, you know, those really real life stories. Like, you know the one I'm talking about? Like, the ones where um, all the odds are stacked against a person, and through grit, hard work, we see them defying all odds to rise above and achieve what they're set out to do. So I'm super pumped today. And like many of you guys are listening, we all have dreams, right? Dreams of bringing our craft to reality. With that being said, this episode is something that you all will truly enjoy. Our guest today is the man of the hour, is someone who I truly admire. His name is Jeremy Logan. He is the founder of Misfits Brewing. Hey, Jeremy, thank you for taking the time out to hang out with us. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure of mine. All right, folks. So this is what we want you guys to do. We want you to sit back, grab you an ice cold one if you've got it. If you're listening to this and it's too early, you know, me and Jeremy let you make the best judgment call on that. So let's dive right into Jeremy's real life story from homebrewing to the startup phase of his brewery, which is today's discussion. And here is the Misfits Brewing's journey. Well, I've been homebrewing for a little over 20 years. I started homebrewing when I was in culinary school. Got out of high school, went to culinary school, wanted to be a chef my whole life. Spent four years in culinary school when I was there. I had a friend who knew how to homebrew and taught me. And it was fun. I grew up in Northern California. It was big out there then. So what I did, just kept messing around in my mom's kitchen, throwing things together, trying different things. I had a beer that I really, really liked. It was called Jamaican Style Brand Red Ale from Mad River Brewing Company. It was super dank, grapefruity, amber ale. And the first recipe I ever created myself was a mimic of that beer. And, you know, I I still brew that every once in a while to this day. I've been in the restaurant business for 30 plus years. And I think that's where I get a lot of my creativity from is I take what I learn in the culinary industry and I apply it to my flavors and my beers. So, you know, I dabbled in homebrewing for a while. I moved to Florida in 1997. Homebrewed a little bit here and there. It was very tough down here because the homebrew and the, the craft beer scene down in Florida back then was very little, very limited. So, you know, I, I played around with it for a little while. I stopped probably 2000 to 2005. Didn't brew at all. When you left California, you came down here. Were you still in the restaurant industry? Yeah, I came down here. I got a job the next day over the phone in a restaurant in Boca. Nice. So, you know, I've been lucky. I've been at the same job as a sous chef for a country club, pretty high profile country club in Boca for the past 22, 23 years. So it's given me a lot of freedoms. But at the same time, I told you I'd stop brewing. And then I met a neighbor who lived in my neighborhood. I used to always walk my dogs and my sons. And I'd go past his house and the recycling bin always had craft beer in it. And down here, that's unheard of. So struck up a conversation with him one day, helped him move some tile. We hit it off. So we started, you know, getting together and drinking craft beer, but he was also a home brewer. So we started home brewing again. Nice. And, you know, dabbled in it here and there. I would say I've been serious about home brewing past eight, nine years. Just learning everything I can, trying to create interesting recipes trying to learn the base styles so this is about 2000 to set the tone you and your neighbor started just home brewing was he trying to go somewhere with it or you guys were just tankering around and just home brewing and enjoying the whole pastime the hobbiness of home brewing that's exactly what it was we, we weren't looking to do anything with it uh you know we both love craft beer i enjoyed the creation of it be able to drink my own stuff and he was newer to craft brewing, so he's starting to enjoy it more. You know, we brew at my house, we brew at his house. What system were you guys using when you guys were brewing? Just a normal little five-gallon system. Yeah, just making five gallons at a time. It's funny because the system I use today is just a 15-gallon kettle. I make five, 10 gallons at a time. It's nothing fancy, just backyard brewing. Nice. But, you know, I think it's more about the creation of the recipe and the love and the attention that you put into it. Mm-hmm. You don't need to buy a fancy system. You, you could do a lesser system. If you put your heart and soul into everything you do, it's going to show. About eight years ago, started just seriously homebrewing, doing batch after batch after batch, trying different things. We actually did what's called a party guile. It's an old style of brewing where you brew a big batch of beer. And then after you do your first runnings, you make a second batch of beer off 
once your second runnings. So we ended up making a barley wine and then we ended up making a pale ale, two batches of beer out of one grain bill. And it was really cool to do that because that really opened my mind to how much more you can do with it. And about nine years ago is when you started taking this um, serious. What made you take that chance? Like what was like the, the mindset behind that? Passion. I developed a total passion for creating good beer. Same thing that brought me to food is the passion I had for creating food that people want to eat. Same thing with beer. I just wanted to create beer that people wanted to drink. It was recipe development, playing with different flavor profiles. Like I said, the party guy, doing different styles of beer. It, mm-hmm. was, it was a lot of fun. Nice. Okay. Yeah. From there, what happened when you started taking it serious? Well, you know, we'd make beer and we'd bring it to parties. We'd share it with friends and we'd do, you know, take it to whatever. And people said, wow, you guys are really good. You should think about doing this. And we're like, at first, you, all right, that's your friends talking, so you, whatever. Yeah. We got that. Probably about three years of that happening, I sat down and I really thought about it. And I thought, you know, this could possibly be something that could happen. The South Florida's starving for it at that time. That was probably five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. So 2015, 2014. So I figured, you know what, let's see if it's feasible. Let's see if it could actually happen. Meanwhile, I kept brewing, throwing parties, entering homebrew competitions, trying to get myself into festivals. And, you know, it, slowly but surely, I started going to these things and creating solid recipes that I could take down the road. You know, not doing the different things every time, but trying to find a core set of recipes where I can brew them over and over again and perfect them as mm-hmm. best I can. So that's when I started really thinking about it. And then Misfits was born in 2013. The guy who lived in the neighborhood, Shane, he was an aquatics director. And he and a whole bunch of his lifeguards and friends were going to do a Tough Mudder. And I've always been very athletic. So he asked me if I wanted to come and join the team. So join the team. And we all did the Tough Mudder. There's 25 of us who did the Tough Mudder in 2013 Miami. We all started. We all finished. Started together. We finished together. You know, we had to come up with a name. And so since they were all aquatic people, they yeah. came up with the name of Neptune's Muddy Misfits. You know, it, we all became a family. And I still talk to almost every single one of those people all the time. A lot of them are still heavily involved in my life. My graphic design guy, Ryan, he's, I talk to him every day. He was on the team. Shane, uh, you know, we became a, a close-knit family. And over the years, we did more things and more things. And they were really the ones who pushed us to try and get misfits going. And so since it was such a family, I wanted to create that family atmosphere with the brewery that we're trying to start. And so the only feasible name I can come up with out of that was misfits. Misfits, yes. And to create that aquatic atmosphere. And since we're in South Florida, if you notice the two M's are two waves. Or the M is two waves. I, I never caught that till just now. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, it just grew from there. So we had support from everywhere we turned. The local community, I was, I was unsure how they would welcome us, but they've done nothing but that. Local breweries all over the place have just been nothing but accepting. So, you know, I just focused on brewing, created recipes, entered competitions, almost forced myself into festivals, just getting people to accept a homebrewer to come down to some of the biggest festivals in Florida. Grovetoberfest, biggest craft beer festival in Florida. And I was there three times. Deerfields Brews and Blues was there every year it was created. And, you know, that's really what started us on our, our serious journey to find home in Deerfield Beach. The mayor came up to our tent the first year, loved it. Loved our style, loved our beer, loved our atmosphere and our flow. And he's like, you know what? I think it's time Deerfield needs a brewery. So we're like, okay. (laughs) But, you know, it's a long process. It was a very long process, still in process. We had the support of the city. We took probably two or three years to figure out how we were going to do it. In this last year, I've signed a lease. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations, man. Thank you very much. I got a 3,000 square foot warehouse down in Deerfield Beach. Sign my general contractor, waiting on a construction permit, a demo permit. So we're 
everything's working, man. I just got goosebumps thinking about that, man. Just <laughs> the transition from actually doing something that you're super passionate <clears throat> about and how it just comes naturally, like the start of the brewery. So let's talk before we get into like where you're at now, let's back up a little bit. So like, was there anything that kind of like, I guess, brick walls that got in your way that you kind of were like, you know what, this home brewing thing is, is cool, but I don't know if it's for me or should I give this up or anything like kind of like slow the process down of, you know, the thrill of actually doing this like serious. Oh yeah. Lots of things, you know, very demanding job. I have a family with two boys, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of obstacles and I've had to work through a lot of them. Like everything. If you're passionate about it, you really stick with it, persevere. Anything's possible. And you know, my journey's not over with yet. I've still got, a lot of hills to climb, but I'm sticking with it and I'm not giving up. So during your homebrew stage, how many batches have you done in like? <laughs> 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 Let's just say the last four years, I've probably made over 300 batches. Oof. Wow. Put it in work. <laughs> I've put in work. I put in a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of time, but it's all paying off. The hard work, the creativity of it, everything. It's been so rewarding. So for the home brewers that are just, you know, just out there, you know, the hobbyists, you know, they're in their mind, they definitely do want to start their own brewery or just get their product out there through contract brewing, whatever it may be. What would you tell them um, since you've been home brewing for a long time, like as far as motivation to continue to go on? Reach out to the community, reach out to the home brewing community to get to know your local breweries, commercial breweries. You'll find a lot of them are very supportive. And they'll help you. Constructive criticism, creation of recipes. You bring them in your homebrew. They'll tell you. Most of them will tell you what's going on with your beer. One of the biggest ones we had with that was Bang & Banjos. Yes, I love that place. (laughs) Yeah, so do I. We came in right before they opened and brought some beers to them. And let me tell you, they were rough. They had strong constructive criticism. But I listened to what they had to say. At first, I was, you know, I was a little disappointed because, you know, they were rough. But... I understand why they were rough. They wanted me to get better. They wanted to see me produce good beer. That's awesome. And, you know, ever since then, we've had a, a great relationship. One of the first big awards I ever won was the second annual Iron Banjo. It's a homebrew competition that Bang & Banjos used to have. It was a, right up my alley because I'm a chef, and it was like a, a chop box recipe. They gave us a list of ingredients. Everybody got the same ingredients. They would go and brew a beer with all those ingredients. We came back, and... Second year that we did it, we won. That was probably one of the best days of my homebrewing life. You want to talk about something that inspires you and makes you want to go to that next step? That. That right there. Just being involved with the competition itself, not even winning, just being involved with the competition. You got other other homebrewers, you got other commercial brewers coming in and judging and tasting and all that. And, you know, to win that is absolutely phenomenal. We had another competition was Firefighters Benevolent Society. Every year they do a competition. There's three awards. There's a judge award, there's brewers award, and there is a people's choice award. First year we entered it, I brought my pumpkin beer, Senior Pumpkinero, to the competition. And we won brewer's choice and second place in people's choice for that beer. To win brewer's choice was very astounding. The first time we ever brought anything to that competition and all the brewers decided that that was the best beer in the competition. That was amazing. That's the way it happens. It, you, feeling. Yeah. Definitely yeah. Really feeling. And talking about what keeps me going is, you know, I approach beer differently. I approach it as a chef. So I think of different flavor profiles that I find interesting. Like I hate pumpkin beer. Absolutely hate what's out there for pumpkin beer. Cause you either have a, a pale ale that has pumpkin spice in it, or a stout that's overly pumpkin and whatever. Maybe I'm just hyper or super critical, but I decided I wanted to do a different style of pumpkin ale. So I created Senior Pumpkinero. It's a pumpkin, cranberry, ginger, habanero beer. It's an amber ale base with all those different flavor profiles in it. And it's entered three competitions. It's won two of them. Hey, congratulations, man. That's awesome. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a very humble person. I'm not bragging. I don't boast on my stuff at all. I just love the fact that I can create a beer that people are enthusiastic about. And that's really cool. That beer is definitely one of them. Awesome. It's just fun, man. Yeah. I love it. So through your homebrew journey, like 
competitions and getting out there, how important is that? Super important. It gets you involved with the community, the home brewing community. You meet so many fantastic people. You learn different things from all the other brewers. Everybody brings something different and you like it. Oh man, how'd you do that? What brought you to do this type of thing or that type of thing? You just talk with everybody and you learn. You always have to keep learning. I still learn everything new and I, I continue to learn every day. I talk to home brewers. I talk to commercial brewers. I talk to everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I talk to people who just like to drink beer and find out what they like about beer. I go back to my drawing board and, you know, I take everything that I hear and it makes me creative because I want to, I want to create a beer that this person over here is going to like, but this person has something to say. So I take it back and I tweak it a little bit and then they both like it. So it's very fun, very creative inspiring nice nice so let's get back onto this journey so about eight years ago nine years ago you started taking this serious and up to 2013 that's when the the logo and the name design came out from 2013 moving forward when did you actually say all right it's time for me to create this brewery let's do it probably late 2015 2016 so about really years three years later um Hey, let's do this, guys. So the process from the idea of doing it till actually you're, well, you're in the process of your doors opening up currently. Can you kind of like walk us through that a little bit? A lot of blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> for lack of a better analogy. I focused a lot of time the first couple of years on picking a core set of recipes and just brewing them to get them to where people wanted to drink them. I knew that I couldn't perfect them because... You never perfect anything. Every, every batch you make is slightly different. But I wanted to get to a point where people wanted to drink my beer. People are excited about my beer. Like I said, I went to competitions and festivals and just homebrewer spotlights down in Miami. I, I was going everywhere, just trying to build my brand, brand recognition, bring in beers that people enjoy. It's been a long journey, and I've done just about everything in every city. So, you know, it's, it's fun. It's tiring, but it's fun. Gotcha. So when you were at this, I said, you said it was a Deerfield beach festival or, and then the, the mayor. Yeah, the oceans, brews and blues. Okay. So, and then the mayor approached you and said, Hey man, this is Deerfield is where it's at. So yeah. when that conversation happened, did you have your heart, mind, soul set for Deerfield or was that still up in the air? No, I did. As soon as the mayor said he wanted us there, they didn't have a brewery there. So why not? Let's take a chance. If we're going to do it, let's do it. And so we chose Deerfield Beach and probably about a year, year and a half ago, we came down a broker and just started looking for places. And, you know, we were looking everywhere. She was coming up with new listings all the time. We tried for a couple of different places, but, you know, one didn't want us, one didn't want to take the liability. Another one was just too expensive. I had investors back out. I had to adjust on the fly. It's been a roller coaster and it's been a long journey, but persistence. And, you know, we had probably three different meetings with the city and they're telling us what they were expecting from us, how they would help us and, you know, where we can go with them. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, so let's, let's get inside the brewery. So you selected this location in Deerfield. What were things that you loved about it? What are some things that, you know, you just had to kind of compromise with? Right now, I love the size of it. It's a 3,000 square foot, 30 by 100 foot building that's almost completely empty. There's three walls that we have to knock down, bring up some tile floor. But, you know, I think just the community itself, it were right down the street from Bang & Banjos and Black Flamingo and it's a Cubano B. We're still working on getting the construction permits so we can start. It's in an industrial complex that has 25 other buildings. So there's tenants everywhere. And one of the first things I like about this is one of the first things I'm going to establish. It's called the Powerline Business Park. And I'm going to create Powerline Business Park Happy Hour. From open to seven, Monday through Friday, anybody who works in that (laughs) complex comes in, dollar off their beers. Love it. I want to create that sense of community. I want to have my neighbors be excited about us coming in. You know, there's all sorts of different great businesses, a lot of blue collar, a lot of exciting people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to bring them in and have a sense of community throughout the establishment. Nice. All right. So inside of their brewery, so you guys kind of allotted room for the tap room and then a lot of room for the production area. Have you guys selected 
on um, the type of brew house you're going with. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Seven Barrel Brew House. Very nice. Right now we're researching where we're going to go, how we're going to do it. But yeah, I think Seven Barrel is what I decided on. It seems to be a good size for what I'm trying to start with. I can easily get a 15 barrel fermenter and that's a lot of beer. (laughs) Seven barrels is 220 gallons. You double that, it's it's a lot of beer. And I got to figure out how I'm going to move all that beer. But I'm, I'm working hard at it. You know, creating a community, trying to get to know bars and restaurants around. You got a ton of them around. You got Coconut Creek, you got Coral Springs, Margate, all those places. Yep. Right in my backyard because I definitely <laughs> bang in banjos. <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah. So I'll be definitely hanging out in Misfits. So in construction, obviously, we know that it, there's a lot of things that go inside of there with plumbing, yeah. you know, outfitting the, the warehouse to actually be, you know, structural capable of handling everything that you guys are going to be doing inside the brew house mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And as you work through that, there's probably a lot of things that are going to, you're going to learn throughout that process as well. Yeah. But yeah, that's, it's, it's really cool. So when is the estimated date for your brewery to kind of. Well, before the whole shutdown of the world happened, I was hoping for Halloween. So now my target goal is between Halloween and the first of the year. Like I said, I have my general contractors signed down payments made. He's pushing to get a demo permit so we can start with the demolition. My architect worked really hard, got my drawings in with the city. They've been in with the city of Deerfield for almost six weeks now. You know, just working on finer details so we can get the permits approved. My general contractor is signing all his subs tomorrow and going to submit all the paperwork to the city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things are moving. The COVID shutdown slowed everything down. Uh, I'd say what I was projecting, I'm probably three or four weeks behind, but we're good in the fact that construction or demo is not going to take very long. It's not a lot. It's just a matter of getting the subs on, getting the permits in and getting approval. Great. Great. The last question that I have, the architectural process that you went through, you know, that can kind of be kind of daunting for the simple fact is that I guarantee when you started this, you had this vision in your mind and uh, the ability to articulate that to your architect. Did you find that process smooth or was it a, a back and forth? And obviously budget played a huge role in exactly how that looked. So yeah. give us like a little bit of a rundown on that process. I was lucky in the fact that I was able to get an architect who was already designed a brewery before. The architect I got is part owner of Nobo in Boynton Beach, Nobo Brewing. So she had a very good knowledge of breweries and how to basically draw blueprints for them. So I told her my vision what I was looking for. Uh, She came back with what she thought we should be looking for and we compromised. We worked back and forth. She was really helpful. She has been this whole time. She still works with me. Spoke to her earlier today. Just trying to get everything. Everybody's on the same page and everybody's pushing to get misfits going forward. Perfect. And she's the architect, obviously, for both the production side and the tap room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to split almost in half. Uh, It's going to be about... 1,250 square foot of tap room, bar, kind of like an L-shaped bar. I want to have communal tables because I'm big on getting people together. This is what I want to, I want to use the brewery for. I want it to be more than just a place for people to come drink beer. I want to be that place that people want to go meet friends or meet new friends or bring a business meeting, business associates. I want to work closely with veterans. That's why I work a lot with Wade. Wade Waddick, who owns Evolution Fitness, he's a retired Marine. Marine. And, you know, he does a lot of events and he always has me there. He always supports me. And I want to support him and veterans. I have a lot of people in my family who were ex Navy. So I want to be a destination bar for not only veterans, but for first responders. I have a lot of friends, a lot of people I care about who are firefighters, policemen, EMTs, whatever. I want Misfits to be a place where people can come and gather. You want to have a party with your firefighter buddies? I'll set it up. I'll do whatever I can to get you guys in there. You know, it's, it's all about creating that sense of community and sense of family is really what I want this to be. I want to do fundraising, charity events. I have a son who has a disability. I'm going to work closely with Special Olympics, creating charity events, sponsor sponsor uh, beach cleanups in Deerfield Beach. 
you know, just doing more with what I've been so graciously given. That's, that's amazing. So like one, one thing that you said touched my beyond, you know, creating a place where, cause you never even mentioned great product, but you know that that's going to be the centralized thing is always creating a great product. But number one thing you said is community and that's way powerful than anything else and able to bring like-minded people to an area so they can hang out, create relationships is amazing. And obviously the product will follow, but number one thing that I love to hear, because I heard another brewery said that it's all about community. For me, yes, the beer is always going to be at a high level, but it's community. And that's wonderful that you said that. And it gives me the chills because I love hearing that when new businesses come in, it's all about creating community, bringing us together. And that's amazing. So I love hearing your story and, you know, definitely you're gonna have to pick your mind again once the brewery opens up and uh, yeah. you're on opening day. Definitely. To wrap this up, man, um, do you have any last minute tips for our home brewers out there that are, you know, wanting to get into this business and start their own brewery? Um, what last little tip can you leave to them to inspire them to keep pushing on? Just keep being creative. Keep reaching out to the home brewing and the commercial brewing community. Don't be afraid to, expose yourself to them bring your stuff in let them try it bring your stuff to me i'd love to try it you know you got to take constructive criticism as it is you learn from it you take it and you learn from it it's all about creativity it's all about being excited about how you're doing it and what you're doing but just keep talking to people keep trying to make friends bring your stuff to festivals bring your stuff to enter as many homebrew competitions as you can just get your stuff out there Yes. And yeah. the theme is, I hear a lot of brewers say that is like the homebrew community sometimes is, I don't know if it's scaredness or whatever it is, but definitely reach out to your local breweries, man. Reach out to people you know, reach out to the, the breweries that you want to create the same type of beers, the same type of atmosphere. Because as you just said, Jeremy, like this community is welcoming for a lot of welcoming. Broward County is welcoming Miami. I heard nothing but great about our South Florida community, brewing community, that everybody is welcoming and it's a pool. This thing happens for, through community, right? Yeah. So if we all work together, that's how we're all going to make it in here. So that's one thing I love about the craft beer industry is the, the togetherness. So to wrap this up, man, you had an amazing story. We're super glad to hear, you know, somebody who has been homebrewing forever. But the fact is that when you started taking this serious, the years that it took you to actually create your own brewery is something that, you know what, it gives me chills. And it's like, it gives us all hope to be like, Hey guys, even if you've been doing this 10 years, when that time you do that switch and you take it serious and you start doing, getting the reps and entering the competitions, getting out there, things just lead you to where you're trying to get to. And obviously it happened with you. So everybody out there, hard work, keep brewing, don't give up enter as many competitions as possible and stay driven, stay driven. Right. So if, not, yeah, if you want to connect with Jeremy and all things misfit brewing, you can check them out on Facebook at misfits with an S brewing on Instagram, the same, the same uh, title misfits brewing and on untapped misfits brewing company. And thank you so much, Jeremy. We appreciate learning with you. We appreciate hearing your story. And we definitely are going to support you this fall, or early part of next year, um, inside of your brewery and enjoying a couple pints with you, my man. Thank you, Sam. I love it, man. Thank you for the opportunity to tell my story. Absolutely. It was a great story, man. So we'll catch you on the next one. All right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Keep it up. <laughs>